Just two years ago, 85,000 copies of an historical thriller were published with the hope it would give an unknown author a boost. The book has now sold more than 25 million copies in 44 different languages. It's called The Da Vinci Code and it's made Dan Brown a very rich man. It's also raised the ire of the Catholic Church. Now the novel makes claims about the deepest secrets of the church and even alleges that Jesus had a daughter. The book's taken on a life of its own, so much so that some readers are confusing the fiction with fact. Today, the Cardinal of Genova, Genoa, one of the Catholic Church's top theologians, dismissed the book as a sack full of lies and urged Catholics to shun it like rotten food. In a moment, we talk to a Vatican art historian and a papal priest in Rome. First, Hayden Jones on that book. This is a book which in 604 pages has managed to upset the highest order of the Catholic Church. It's a novel, a story which isn't even true. Yet the Church says anyone who reads it has sinned. Have you read this book? Yes. What do you make of it? It was a good story. Do you read it? Yeah, I've read it. But the problem may not be the story it tells, but rather the number of people who have picked it up and read it. I'd like to read it again. I think you can get more out of it the second time. Brilliant. It's very hard to put down. You see, the Da Vinci Code has sold 25 million copies worldwide. There are walking tours around Rome based on the book. And in New Zealand, it's sold 130,000 copies and been top of the bestseller list for 46 weeks. There's a sense among senior church officials that you simply can't ignore something like this, that lots of people are carrying this book around. You know, lots of people are walking through this town and others uh, on Da Vinci Code tours, and many of them undoubtedly uh, are taking it seriously. The Da Vinci Code suggests Jesus fathered a child to Mary Magdalene and therefore has relatives still alive today. I thought it was really good. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses came over to my door and I was all Mary Magdalene this, blah, 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 blah. Jesus had a kid. Yeah. What are the Jehovah's Witnesses? Are they very happy about that interpretation of the Bible? Um, no, they pretty much left and they've left our house alone for a very long time. Its author, Dan Brown, suggests the clues are in Leonardo da Vinci's paintings, like The Last Supper. Is that Mary Magdalene dining next to Jesus, or his disciple John? I don't think it's true, because at The Last Supper, there was John next to him, and John was the youngest apostle, and just because he was John the youngest, and obviously younger people will look better looking, it doesn't mean it's a woman. Fact or fiction? Oh, that's a good question. I get letters from priests who say, thank you. I may not agree with some of the ideas in your book, but I've got a congregation of people who are talking about spirituality in new ways. The Da Vinci Code also suggests the conservative arm of Catholicism, Opus Dei, is a murdering, ruthless group trying to keep its secrets covered up. Do the Catholics have anything to fear from Dan Brown? Not if they're not guilty, no. If they have, maybe. What is This is a book which tells a story, not a true story, but it has a lot of people upset. For Catholics, there is only one good book, and it's certainly not this one. That's the biggest selling book in the world, that one. Well, earlier today, I mean the good book, not the Da Vinci Code. Earlier today, I asked Professor Elizabeth Lev, an art historian at the Duquesne University in Rome, whether she believed the Da Vinci Code was damaging to the Catholic faith. I think it's damaging for Catholics who are, are poorly formed, Catholics who don't have a proper catechesis, an understanding of their faith, an understanding of their history. And this book presents a very easy, very conspiracy theory, exciting version of Catholic history, which is very easy, which leads them down a road of error, and then makes it very difficult to bring people back from this, um, these mistakes and from these misconceptions. So you're seeing it with lay people coming and reinterpreting this art? I see it in a two-pronged effect. I see it, one, with tourists, adults who come to Rome. They take tours. They visit the Vatican. They visit Rome. And they approach art with this, you know, looking for conspiracies, looking for hidden symbols, looking for hidden meanings, instead of looking at the actual beautiful works of art. 
But more problematically, I see it in the students who are coming over here, students that have very little exposure to Renaissance masters or really art in general. They come to Rome, their only knowledge of art is Leonardo, their only understanding of Leonardo has been given to them by the Da Vinci Code, and so instead of learning to look, to understand, to, to appreciate the technique of art, they just pay attention to a very simple, superficial analysis. Art does not lend itself to this kind of easy reading into this kind of simplistic vision of it. Is there an upside that Dan Brown has got people thinking about it, looking at this art? In a certain sense, yes. It is good that people are A, talking about the church, B, talking about art, taking an interest in art. But then the problem that develops that an actual, the actual appreciation of a work of art takes time, takes love, takes affection, and takes diligence. Something that this book doesn't offer. This is easy answers. Art is the beauty of finding the complex truth of technique, tradition, all in one visual manifestation. So it has perhaps a slight effect that we can say Leonardo and people's heads will pop up, but then it takes us twice as much work to show people what is beautiful about Leonardo. Personally, do you think it's a good book or a silly book? I don't, for, as an art historian, of course, I'm, I'm offended that the, the lead character calls himself an art historian. I don't really see any of the method, discipline, or science. It makes us look like we're just a bunch of, I don't know, it, uh, I wouldn't really know what we were, what, how to describe us. But it doesn't reflect our method, it doesn't reflect what we do, and it certainly doesn't reflect our dedication to loving and understanding works of art. Insofar as the story is concerned, it's certainly a page-turner, and it doesn't consume a great deal of time. Well, 25 million copies sold, it certainly had a nerve with some people. Yes, it, 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 it brings out, it brings out in a fun, interesting, adventurous way a lot of deeper things that people really do think about. The church, it tells us something very interesting. Art and the church are fascinating to people. This institution, this 2,000 year old institution, is something that catches people's attention. And man's manifestations through art and through culture is something that also interests people. It's just that people don't have the time or the tools to really explore it and really understand it. So when they're offered this quick little jaunt through our greatest traditions, it's a wonderful ride. Well, also with us earlier today was a priest with the Opus Dei group in Rome. I asked Father John Walker if he agreed with the church's statement that the novel was like rotten food, which did more harm than good. Uh, at first reading, the book is, to my mind, hilarious. It's a comedy of errors. You're kind of waiting to see what error the author is going to make next, and he makes errors on almost every single page. The only real tragedy would be if someone were to take the book seriously, if someone were to forget that this is a work of fiction and that any pretense to actually informing people about history, about the church, about art, about religion, about scripture is completely bogus. Is there a problem that people that have less faith may be influenced by this book? A lot of people, obviously, a lot of people have read the Da Vinci Code, but I doubt that it's having a big impact on the religious behavior of people. It is probably provoking some questions in some people's minds. But I don't think that the kind of serious change in a person's belief about God is going to be brought about by reading the Da Vinci Code. Why would the Cardinal come out now and say that this book's an attempt to discredit the church? I think the Cardinal, being a, the Bishop of uh, Genoa, has a pastoral responsibility to clarify for his flock what is true and what is false in the book. If I were a bishop, which I'm not, I would certainly feel that responsibility. Those things have to be said. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why I think the book can end up doing more good than harm, because the cardinal sees it, I believe, as a teaching moment. This is an opportunity to talk about the faith and to explain some important things to people probably that they haven't been thinking enough about and that's why the Da Vinci Code provokes certain questions in their minds so it is an opportunity to talk about things and as the bishop of his flock he should seize this moment to talk and explain the truth of the faith to them Opus Day is depicted as an evil organization has this damaged you? No, I don't think uh, most readers of the book 
think that the depiction of Opus Dei is something to take seriously. Opus Dei, after all, is a prelature of the Catholic Church. The founder of Opus Dei is a saint. There's nothing terribly secret about it. The head of Opus Dei is a bishop. There's universities and hospitals run by Opus Dei all over the world. When the founder was canonized a few years ago in here in Rome, there came to Rome one of the largest crowds in the last century. There's nothing secret about it at all. If anyone cares to find out about Opus Dei, it's quite easy to do so. And in case you haven't read the book or you just don't want to, you uh, well, you can catch it on the uh, big screen next year. Ron Howard's directing a Hollywood version of the novel. It's going to star Tom Hanks. Apart from counting his money, Dan Brown is apparently writing his next novel at his home in the northeastern United States.